Grady on Zion. Next Sunday is Parking Lot Communion, and we can't wait to see you all. Make plans now to get up early, load the family in the car, and join us in the parking lot by 7.30 a.m. Our deacons and security ministry will disperse your communion packets as you arrive. Once you have parked, just tune into 104.7 FM on your radio dial to hear our services. If you're unavailable to join us at the church, services will still be streamed on Facebook Live at 10 a.m. Please note, we will still maintain COVID-19 safety measures during this service and the church building will remain closed. Make plans now to invite a friend or a neighbor to park alongside of you and worship with us. See you next week. my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, let it prove to be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are my strength, and, Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. And this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. May we all say together, amen. Amen. This is our Tuesday, words of encouragement, man. This is coming at the end of our month, and, uh, wow, it's been a tremendous month. And our theme has been, uh, you know what, biblical truths to deal with Christian misery, and we have taken the Tuesday to deal specifically with Satan. So this is our last um, our insert that we're going to deal with Satan on today. So we're going to be talking about satanic resistance. Satanic resistance. Amen. Paul tells us in Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. Amen. And what Satan does, I mean, what, what he does, he uses what I call the two Ps. He uses pain and pleasure. And he uses those two things real well uh, to make us blind, to make us stupid, and make us miserable. And so we need to know about Satan. Amen. So what do you really know about him? We really know more of what the Bible tells us about him. So we're going to walk through the Bible. We're going to give you a lot of scriptures today. But we're going to walk through the Bible and we're going to talk about Satan. And then we're going to talk about spiritual warfare and then we'll be done. Amen. So what did the Bible tell us about Satan? Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 9 through 10. Amen. And the Bible calls him a great dragon was cast out, the old serpent. And then he calls him by name. He calls him the devil. And he calls him Satan. The devil, the Satan, the devil, the Satan, amen, the slanderer, uh, the deceiver. That's why he's called a devil. And uh, Satan is the adversary. You know, that means he's our adversary. He's our enemy. He deceived the whole world. For he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. John 12, 31. We look at John chapter 12, verse number 31. So now the judgment of this world now shall... He's called the prince of this world is going to be cast out. And what do you mean by the world? He means by a system by which we operate apart from the word of God. So anytime your life is not living according to the word of God, Matthew 4, 4, man should live by what every word, then what's what? That is the world because that's the system by which you operate your life. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, amen, there he is again. He's called the God of this world, small g, because what? 
he has blinded the minds of them which what believe it's not uh, lest the light of the glorious what gospel of Christ who is the image of God should be what should what should scribe unto them so should shine unto them so all of these things are part of what he's called he's called the God of this world he's called the, the prince of the world he's called Satan he's called the devil he's the slander he's the accuser and that's exactly who he is now Peter warns us about him in first Peter 5 and 8 and he warns us about him. He said, be sober. The word sober means to be, what, sensible. To be sensible as a believer. Be vigilant. That means be watchful. I mean, be on guard. Be always sensitive. Because your adversary, there he is, the devil, he comes as a roaring lion, what, so walking about, seeking whom he will, what, devour. Devour means to destroy and what he's going to destroy? He's going to destroy what? He's going to destroy your, your resources with God. He's going to destroy your ministry. He's going to destroy your influence. He's going to destroy uh, your fellowship with the Lord. He's, he's out to destroy all of that. Amen? The sad thing about it is that many of us willfully follow him. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Ephesians 2 and 2. He says, where did the time pass where you walked according to the course of this world? He's telling believers, number one, you got to straighten up. Because now in the time you willingly walk in the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit not working in the children, what? Of disobedience. So you got unbelievers are walking according to Satan, and then you got believers who are just disobeying the word of God, and they're walking in the course of Satan as well. Satan has a strategy that he comes that we need to be what? Not ignorant about, as Paul says. And I'm going to walk through this quickly with you, amen? His first strategy, and this is how you know this is the devil operating in me. Number one, lies. Lies. John 8, 44. And John 8, 44, and Jesus told him, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your what? Of, of your father, that's what you do, and uh, that's going to be your desire, because he was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode what? Not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he speaketh what? A lie. And he's speaking of his own, for he is a liar, and the Bible says he's the father of it. So anytime that you lie, that's the devil operating in you, amen? That's the devil. Anytime you want to see people, that's the devil operating in you. Number one, it's lie. Number two, he blinds us. He blinds us. Go back to 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 4, what he does? He blinded the minds of them which believe not. Those who are not trusted in the word of God, the enemy blinds you to the truth. And so therefore, you're not blind. I know many of us, and I don't know about you, but I've been in a situation in my life where I was blinded, not trusting the word of God. And then all of a sudden the light come on. You say, how in the world did I let myself get into something like this? Or how in the world this happens to me? It's because when you don't stay close to the word of God, the enemy has a way of blinding you uh, to the truth of God. That is the devil, amen? Number three, he masquerades. He masquerades, amen? Second Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. Second Corinthians 11. For he, such are false apostles. See, Satan, Satan doesn't attack the church. He just joins the church. He joins the church. He comes in, man. He don't come in and sit in the pew. He comes in and get active. He comes in as an apostle. He comes in as a deceitful worker. You know, this is the person, man, who are uh, operating uh, in a position that God has not called them to. He comes in as deacons that should not be deacons, as ushers who should not be ushers, as choir members who should not be choir members. And they're able to change themselves to make people think they've been sent by Christ. 14, in verse 14. And, what, and no marvel, marvel means don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. He can make you think. And what do you mean by that? He's in the pulpit. He's preaching. And he's preaching and folk like it. He can change himself into an angel of light that he can actually make wrong look right. In verse number 15. Amen. Therefore, it is no great thing that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be what? According to their works. And what's going to happen is, is that you're going to what? Be able to tell the tree by the fruit it bears. 
And so this is the thing that Satan does. He masquerades. Number four, he does miracles. He does the miraculous. And a lot of people are really, man, blown away by miraculous things. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan. For he comes with all power and signs and lying wonders. I mean, he can do things, man, that make you think that it's God. And uh, one of the biggest problems we have is that we have a tendency to think that everything that's supernatural is God. And the enemy is able to do that kind of thing. Years ago, I remember I was, went to a revival meeting. And in the revival meeting, this, this pastor, uh, this preacher, or evangelist, what he called himself, was able to, uh, to take a jug of water and took that jug of water and then he put his hands upon it and he said, everybody that's not saved will not be able to lift that water. And so therefore, people were blown away with that. The only problem with that, the Bible does not give any type of guidance and leadership that this would be a sign of whether a person is saved or not. That's Satan. He does things in miraculous ways, but he does things in a ways that's not what? In line with the scriptures. The Bible, verse number five, the Bible says he tempts us. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number three, he tempts us. But fear less by any means that the serpent, what? Beguiled Eve, he deceived her through his subtlety that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The enemy has a way of tempting you and deceiving you that this is going to work out apart from the word of God. This is what he did with Jesus, amen, to try to convince him that if something else can work out and it can work out apart from the word of God, that is nothing but the devil. The enemy, number six, can pluck the word completely out of your heart. You know, people that come in and they hear the word of God, and guess what? If they don't stay in God's word, the enemy would take all of that stuff right out of your heart. I mean, you have you shouting on Sunday morning and shouting while you're in the service, and some of you, before you even get to the parking lot, that enemy that snatched that word completely out of your heart. First Thessalonians 3 and 5. And First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 5. He said, for this call, for this reason, which I could no longer forbear, I said to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter would have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So Paul said, look, man, I've been doing all of this stuff and I've been what? You know what? I've been praying for you in advance because I knew that all the stuff that I taught you, the enemy could come and take that completely away from you. Number seven, sicknesses and diseases. Sicknesses and diseases. Luke 13 and 16. And Luke 13 and verse number 16. And, 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 and here's there was a woman. The woman, you remember, she was all bent over. And, and Jesus saw her. And he says, and ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound? Lo, these 18 years that he loosed this bond on the, on the Sabbath day. Satan can actually touch your body. And cause sickness to be in your body. And, and a whole lot of this. I mean, and it's not, I mean, I'm not going to give you the script. I'm not going to deal with that. Paul talked, to, I mean, David talked about that. Before he repented, he talked about, man, about his sin and what his sin had done to him. And the Bible, the Bible, the Bible said and that, that, that David said that his, sin, his bones begin to ache. That's what his sin was doing with him. And so Satan can actually, what, attack your body. In Acts 10, verse number 38. And how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Satan did it. Satan did it. Now, now, now don't get confused. I don't want you to think that all sicknesses have to do with Satan. Because you remember in John 8 when the story was told about the blind man? And they asked the question of who sinned, whether he or his parents. And Jesus said, neither one has sinned. God just suffered that to be so. But there are a lot of sins and sicknesses that are called directly by Satan himself. Why? Because of our disobedience with God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Number eight. <laughs> Number eight. Amen. Number eight. He's a murderer. 
In John 8, 44, the Bible talks about that. It talks about Jesus, about, about the enemy. He was a murderer from the beginning. Started with Cain. When Cain killed Abel. Amen? And so therefore, if you got that kind of spirit in you, that's the spirit of the devil. He's a murderer. Number nine. And this is the big one here. He fights true ministers and true missionaries from God. Satan will fight them. He will fight them. And now I'm going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and what Paul had to deal with in verse number 17. He said, but we brethren being taken from you for a short time in prison. He says, not in our heart, man. We did not want to be taken from you. For we endeavored the more abundantly to see you face to face with great desire. What happened? Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. And there are a lot of times, man, you're going to be trying to do the will of God, and the enemy is going to come in and block it. He's going to block it. He attacks evangelists. He attacks true ministers. He attacks, he attacks men because he wants to hinder the work. He wants to keep it from happening. And that's exactly what the enemy does. And here's number 10. He accuses us before God. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 10. And he says, I heard a voice saying in heaven, now comes salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God. What? Day and night. We saw that in Job 1 and 11. In Job 1 and 11, we saw it. Amen. We saw what the devil would do. He accused Job. And what did he accuse Job? He accused God, Job, to, to, to God that Job only loved God because of all that God was doing for him. And he said, listen, man, if you were to take that stuff away from him, Job would curse you to your face. And the enemy is always, man, accusing us before God. And he said, that's exactly what he does. So what do we do about this enemy? What do we do? And I get a lot of talk about spiritual warfare. You know, and people say stuff, and I'm going to put Satan under my feet, and, and Satan, I'm going to tear your kingdom down. You know, this word is kind of dangerous to me when I live this kind of thing about what you're going to do. But here's the thing you have to understand. Satan has already been defeated. He's been defeated by Christ. You know, we have already received the victory. We do not have to bind Satan. We don't have to fight for victory over Satan. The victory has already been won. And so we got victory, what? In Jesus Christ. That's what we have. And let me give you three things about that, amen? Number one, Jesus said, I come to destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse John, verse number three and eight. And first John, verse number three and eight, amen? Amen? For he that cometh, what? Uh, 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 he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sent it from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was what? Manifested. That means he was made known. What did he do? So he might destroy the works of the devil. So that means that none of us in here can say the devil made me do anything. Because the devil can't make you do anything. Because God has put Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in us that the works of the devil can be destroyed. So I don't know what this spiritual war, what, what, what are we fighting? We're not fighting the devil. That's not our issue. That issue has already been won. Amen. Hebrews 2 and 14. Hebrews 2. For as much then as what? As the citizen that partakers what? Uh, of, of, of our flesh and, and blood, that he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And that is what? The devil. I mean, that's devil. That power to be able to separate me from God is no longer possible in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus can say, I will never leave you, nor would I ever forsake you. That kind of security was given to us even by Jesus himself. But he said, look, listen, you're in my hand, and I'm in the Father's hand. So nobody can pluck you out of my hand. What are you fighting for? And you still, you got to fight the devil? No, he's already... 
His works have already been destroyed. His works have been disarmed. Colossians 2 and 15. He said, having spoiled the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Why? That happened at Calvary. That happened in Calvary, amen? And all the principalities and all the powers and all the things that we said that Satan had, Jesus Christ triumphed over them. For not only he died on, on the cross, but he labored what? To get up on that Sunday morning. And so therefore the devil has been defeated. And here's the last thing I want to tell you about the devil. Ultimately, he would be defeated utterly. Revelation 20 and 10. And Revelation 20 and 10, and the devil that deceived for what for them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And when the beast, what, and the false prophet are, and where shall be what, tormented what, day and night forever and what, ever. Amen. Does that sound like that we ought to be intimidated by the devil? No. It doesn't sound like that at all. And so what is the spiritual warfare? The warfare you're fighting is with yourself. You know, you're not really fighting the devil. You're fighting with denying yourself. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. So let me give you four hours, and I'm going to leave you alone on how you can engage in the spiritual warfare. The first thing it is, is just resist. The Bible tells us to resist. First Peter 5, 9. Remember, the devil is a roaring lion. But Peter said, hey, whom you resist steadfastly. That means firm. Be firm in resisting. And how did you resist him? In the faith. By trusting the word of God. Knowing that the same affliction are accomplishing your brother that are in the world. So don't worry about all the stuff you go through. Stay trusting God. And then you can resist Satan. And the Bible talks about it again in James 4 and verse number 7. It says, if you submit yourselves therefore to God, you can resist the devil. And he will do what? Flee from you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Number one is resist. Number two is refuse. Refuse. Ephesians 4 and 27. It says, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. That's why the Bible says, in all your ways acknowledge God. So what do you do? We talked about this Sunday. We talked about whenever you're in a situation in your life, then you go to God and say, God, how do you want me to handle that? So why? Because I want to make sure I don't give a place to the devil. If I don't trust you to make the judgments for me, then I'm going to trust my judgment, and my judgment is always going to be the devil. And so, therefore, I don't give place to the devil. I know you feel like cussing some people out sometimes, but you got to run to God when you feel that way and say, God, how do you want me to respond to this person? What's going to represent you when I respond to this person? Because if I don't do that, I'm going to give the de place what? To the devil. you got to know what to refuse. You know, and here's number three, you got to recommit. You got to make that commitment to stay with God no matter what happens in your life. Ephesians 6 and 11, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11, it says to put on the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God. In other words, protect yourself against Satan. Protect yourself. And you look at the armor, all the armor is designed to really be defensive. You're defending yourself against the attacks of the devil. And that's why he tells you to put on some stuff like, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. What is the breastplate of righteousness? Your breast area covers your heart and your most vital part of your body. So the way you can keep the devil from being able to attack you in that area is stay in the word of God because the righteousness is of Christ and the righteousness is in the word of God. So that's why you're protecting your heart. You're protecting your heart, and you protect your heart that way, amen? And then he says what? Put on the what? The, 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 the belt of truth, the girdle of truth. What is the, a belt does? What it does, really, it arranges everything. It's like a, uh, in a woman's sense, it's a girdle. That's what they call it. And what a girdle does, it arranges stuff because stuff is all out where you don't want it to be. You put a girdle to put everything back in arrangement. And so that's what God is saying. 
put on the belt of truth so that God can arrange everything in your life, then the marriage can be what God wants it to be. Then the life could be the way God wants it to be. Because without the girdle of truth, it's going to be all everywhere. Everything's going to be hanging out. Things are going to be the way it ought to look. It's not going to look right. It's not going to represent God. So put on the girdle of truth. Amen. Put on the shield of faith. And what is the shield? You can fight the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what Jesus did? Every time the enemy attacked him, Jesus came with a word. He said, hey, it is written that this, it is written that, it is written. And that's what you got to be. That's what, bam, he shoots something at you and you go, no, 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 no. It is written that we, I don't do this, amen. And so this is what it means by the shield of faith. And then put on the what? Well, charge your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I like that, amen? Because what your feet does, your feet determine your walk. It determines what direction your life is going in. And so what you want to do, you want to what? You want to listen to the good news of God and what Jesus has given, the victory that God has given us, because that's going to determine our walk. Walk in the spirit, Galatians 5, 16, that you won't fulfill the lusts of, of the flesh. And then he says what? Well, put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And the helmet of salvation simply means your, 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 in your head is your brain. Your brain is the control center of your body. So you got to put on the helmet of salvation. You got to protect your brain because that's going to control your body. In the same way, you got to protect your mind because your mind controls your spirit. So you got to put your helmet on. You got to make sure certain things don't get on your mind. You got to protect what you listen to. You got to protect what you look at. And there's some things I turn out, put the helmet on. I got to put the helmet on that. Because if I get that stuff in my mind, it's going to control my spirit and control how I conduct my life and the decisions that I make. Put on the helmet of salvation. Here's the final thing. I've given you three ways of dealing with the devil. Resist, refuse, recommit. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. You got to learn how to rely on the obedience of the word of God in prayer. I'm going to you understand, when you talk about spiritual warfare, remember that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means it's not something you can do yourself. In no way in the world, if you're in flesh, you can fight somebody's spirit. How can you fight a spirit? You can't even see it. So the weapons are not carnal. So what weapons do we have? What is spiritual warfare? The word of God and prayer. Let's go to Ephesians 6 again, verse 17 to 18 as we close. This is what he says. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now, if you ever notice something, that is the last weapon. And what really empowers us is the fact that it's an offensive weapon. The helmet is defensive. The shield is defensive. The, you know, uh, uh, the, the girdle is defensive. The, the feet shod in preparation, that's defensive. The only offensive weapon is the sword. Now, watch this now. We've been told that we can't fight the devil. Why? Because the weapons of the warfare are not carnal. That means it's not fleshly. That means the fight is not with flesh and blood. So the sword is not our weapon. It's the sword of the spirit. So the sword is the Holy Spirit's weapon because a spirit has to fight a spirit. And so where's, what, then how do you, how's your sword activated? It is activated by the word of God. So, so that's why the enemy don't want you to read the word. He don't want you to get the word on the inside of you because every time you read the word, you're storing up weapons that the Spirit of God can use to fight the enemy that's attacking your life. See? And it's like many people don't understand that when you read the Word of God, I read six chapters of Scripture this morning, and when you read the Word of God, how many of you ever read it and didn't remember what you read? Okay? You know? And the reason why you didn't remember what you read is because you didn't need it right then. But what you were doing was storing it up in your inventory. So when the enemy attacks you, the Spirit of God will bring back to remembrance that which you have put in your inventory, and that's how he fights your battle. That's why some of us are defeated. 
are, are just are cast out. Some of us can take a licking and get right back up. It depends on the inventory that you what? That you have put in your mind, and that is the word of God. Amen? And then in verse number 18. In verse number 18, amen? Now, praying always with prayer and supplication. What? In the spirit. What does it mean by that? You pray, but you pray with an idea, idea that God can supply everything you need. But why do you want to pray in the spirit? Why? Because the spirit will make intercession in our prayer. Because the spirit knows that we don't pray like we ought to pray. So the spirit can turn around as we are praying and really go to God and get from God what we really need. That's why a lot of times we get blessings we don't ask for. Amen. We get blessing. I ain't anybody other than me ever got a blessing that you didn't even ask for that blessing. That God stepped in and gave it to you. Why? Because you were asking for one thing, but the Holy Ghost interceded and said, no, he don't need that. This is what he really needs. So thank God for the Holy Spirit. And so that's exactly what, he, what he's talking about. And so we what? This is what, how we what? Deal with the devil. And all of his strategies are going to happen. Just keep in mind, I just need to resist, I need to refuse, I need to recommit, and I really need to rely on one thing, the two things, that is the word of God and prayer. Give God praise and glory. God bless you for these words of encouragement on today. Amen? On today. Again, we want to remind you uh, here at GYZ that we are concerned about your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ, and it's more important at time like this that we have a Savior. We want to help you, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, to help you to learn that you can have one with him. Uh, just simply call our number, uh, church number 706-724-1720. When you call that particular number, we'll be able what to have one of our ministers get in contact with you. Leave a message for us. Get in contact with you, and we'll talk to you about your relationship with Christ. Pray with you and pray for you. If you don't have a church home, don't worry about it. You can connect to Greater Eagle Zion. Even though I've, we are disconnected from physical fellowship, you can connect still with the church. Be a part of the, of the body of Christ and not only be a part of the corporate believers as we work together to continue to minister to the age that we're ministering into. So I want to just challenge you today. Uh, after this, uh, I leave, uh, you're, you're here again. You can write the number down. Please call us. We want you to be saved. We want you to be in the church. We want you to continue to benefit in your personal walk with the Lord. And so we want to help you with that on today. On tomorrow in our broadcast, we conclude our series on truth. And we're talking about tomorrow, the truth for depression the truth we need to know about depression and we're going to we're going to cover that on tomorrow uh, at 12 noon and i hope that you could tune in and be a part of that with us we continue to pray for this pandemic and we continue to pray for each and every one of you as well that god would bring the healing only he can bring and also we're praying for those who are, are sick uh, those who are afflicted by this pandemic those who are bereaved in this pandemic uh, families who are bereaved, we want to pray for them as well. We want to pray for our leaders, national, state, and local. Pray for all of our medical personnel as well. We want to pray for them as well too. Amen. I want to keep in mind that, that we appreciate all of your support of GYZ. And we want you to know that we appreciate those who sow seeds into this ministry. Feel free to do that. You'll get to hear about how you can do that as well at the end of this broadcast. So God bless you. Stay tuned. And we're going to close out on today with prayer. And uh, we would look forward to seeing you on tomorrow at 12 noon. Father, we want to thank you again for this word. Thank you again for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you have taught us on today. And God, we continue to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. In a time like this, we glorify your name, Father, in a way uh, that would be a benefit to the people of God. We pray, God, that you would move only as you would move. Manifest yourself only as you can. Continue to keep us, God, is our prayer. For God, we believe you, we trust you, and we, oh Lord, we lift everything up to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for tuning. Thank in. you for tuning in today. A CD of today's message can be mailed to you for just seven dollars. Please call the church office at 706-724-1720 and reference today's date or sermon title when placing your order. If you would like to become a member of our church or are in need of prayer, call the church office at 706-724-1720 or join our prayer call. The information is listed on the screen. GYZ is a Bible teaching church seeking, reaching, and teaching all to live for Christ. We invite you to tune in again for our regular broadcasts, Tuesdays at 10.30 a.m., Wednesdays at noon, and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You can also follow us on social media at GYZ Augusta. Please be sure to like our pages and even share them with a friend. If this program has been a blessing to you, please consider giving to our ministry. We have many ways to give, including online through the Give Plus app, our church website at gradyyoungzion.org, or you can give easily via cash app. Just type in G-Y-Z-A-U-G. Don't miss another dynamic sermon series led by our own Pastor William B. Blunt starting next week. The keys to a well-lived life. Invite a friend to tune in and be blessed by this teaching. Until we meet again, we pray you have a blessed week. May the Lord continue to cover your families with his hedge of protection and grant you peace in the midst of this pandemic.